Good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Steve Bierman, and the title of this talk is Mind Your Health. Throughout the day, you'll be hearing from a series of speakers talking about a variety of different subjects. And naturally, you'll be using your mind, your memory, your thoughts, your imagination, your wishes, perhaps, your hopes. You'll be using your mind to take in and understand the information they are conveying hopefully including this talk as well. But what it may interest you to know is that the science that underlies much of what you'll be hearing, much of what your doctors think and tell you, that science is completely exclusive of all things mental. Traditional allopathic medicine, for example, MDs, are taught a science that contains in it, of course, cells and molecules and charges and fields. But none of the emergent properties that make you, you, your hopes and dreams, your intentions, your wishes and imagine, imaginations, none of those things are part of traditional materialistic science. So it's no wonder to me, at least, that we feel diminished when as patients we confront a physician or enter a large medical establishment or listen to a prognosis or a treatment plan. The science underlying all of that ignores entirely the things that make us humans, the things that make you, you. And so today with this talk, we ask a question which I think is among, if not the most important question relating to your health and your care. And that is, does mind matter? Does it even matter that we think or discuss this thing we call mind? And if it, if it does matter, the question I would ask is, whose mind? What mind? Is it the mind of the caregiver, the doctor, the physician? Or is it the mind of the patient? Let's begin by exploring whether it is the mind of the caregiver that matters. And in order to do that, I'd like to take you back in time, back all the way to ancient Greece, and tell you a story that at first fascinated me, and then I dismissed, and then later once again fascinated me in an entirely different way. This is a story of a patient who had what he perceived to be a problem, baldness, who went to um, the medical establishment of the time, the chief medical establishment of the time, a grand uh, temple in Epidaurus where the Esculapians were practicing their kind of medicine. And on a large stone outside that temple, is written an account not only of this particular patient, but of many patients who went to the Escalapian temple for a traditional healing ritual. As uh, the account records, this man, after performing the necessary rites and rituals, went to the temple, was admitted to the inner sanctum, uh, therein had a uh, dream therapy, and it was recorded that in the dream he was visited by the god, his head was anointed. And when he woke, as he left the temple, he was growing hair. Now, I imagine most of you react initially as I did to that. Quaint, quaint little superstition, highly unlikely it actually occurred, but a good advertisement nonetheless by the Escalapians. Now, I'd ask you to bear that in mind while I tell you another story that casts the story of the bald man in an Escalapian temple in an entirely different light, and also bears deeply on our question of whether the mind of the caregiver matters. Years ago, I examined a man in the emergency room at Scripps and Sanitas who had uh, bronchitis. And as I lifted his uh, shirt to auscultate his breath sounds from behind, I noticed that he had far more hair than I'd ever seen on any man's 
back before. There was virtually no skin apparent. And I asked him, is that natural or is something going on here? Have you always been like this? He said, oh no, doc, no, not at all. I'm on this drug minoxidil for my blood pressure. And as you may know, one of the side effects is hirsutism, hair growth. Well, you can imagine that in that man, it was problematic. Excuse, amongst the women who were taking minoxidil, I'm sure it was a lot more than problematic. And in fact, Upjohn, the company that was manufacturing it at the time, had numerous lawsuits already filed and a whole lot more coming. And so there was a crisis in the company. Now, someone smart in the company said, well, wait a minute. We may be able to pull ourselves out of this. What we need to do is we need to run a placebo-controlled trial and test whether minoxidil applied topically is better than a placebo, just the vehicle they call it, for hair growth. And that's exactly what they did. They undertook this very elaborate, very precise placebo-controlled trial where they had a, a vehicle, not dissimilar, I should say, from what the old barbers called snake oil. And in it, on the testing side, they put minoxidil and the control side, nothing. And it was quite remarkable because what happened was twofold. One, uh, the results showed that, in fact, minoxidil did cause hair growth. And that product went on to be called Rogaine and became a billion dollar, multi-billion dollar uh, market for the company. But it also saved the company from financial ruin. To me, and I hope to you, what actually is more interesting than the minoxidil outcome was the placebo outcome. Now this study was done twice, and in both times the results were virtually the same. In the first study, 34% of the patients who had the snake oil, let's call it only, grew hair. And in the second time it was run, it was something on the order of 36%. But think what we've just shown. Think what we've just shown. There was nothing whatsoever in the control group vehicle that could actively have caused hair growth. But there was something, wasn't there? There was the suggestion by the physician who was administering the test that if you get the active stuff, then you will grow hair. And that suggestion carried tremendous weight. No, no simple thing because the simple idea promoted by that physician went somehow into the cells themselves and de-repressed the protein production that was necessary for hair growth, all the way down into the tiny machinery of the cell itself. You think about that and think back to the Escalapian Temple, and you realize that it's not such a quaint superstition anymore. There may be a kernel of truth in there that's incredibly important for your health and mine. Now, let me tell you the other side of that story, because this is also important. This is critically important, and it will bear deeply on what I end up suggesting to you are ways in which you can use your mind to sustain and promote your health. This next study comes from the World uh, Journal of Surgery in the year 1980. And it was a cancer treatment trial for patients with gastric carcinoma. The uh, test groups were divided into three. Group one got one form of treatment, group two got another form of treatment, and group three got placebo. And here's what happened. They were all told the same thing. They were told that this is a placebo controlled trial. You may or may not be getting the active agent. If you do get the active agent, there's a very high probability you will lose your hair. So think about this for a minute. 
This is the physician in charge of a very important, critically important, perhaps even life-saving life placebo-controlled clinical trial. And he's telling patients that if you get the drug, then you will lose your hair. And once again, the results were fascinating, but not, not so much in the way you might have thought. The first uh, two groups responded somewhat favorably to the chemotherapeutic treatment. And over time, that was worked out. The third group, remember, was the placebo group. And here's something fascinating happened. Here, one third of the patients, very close if you'll remember to the percentage of patients in the minoxidil study who grew hair, in this World Journal of Surgery study, 30% of the patients lost hair in the placebo group. Now let's think about this. The it's very common for people to say, oh, well, this has to do with belief, but no, this doesn't have to do with belief. The patients don't know if they're getting the drug or the placebo. So at best, their belief is somewhat eroded by doubt that they know they're in a randomized controlled study. There's at least a reasonable chance they're getting the placebo, and in their view, that would mean no hair loss. So it's not about uh, belief. What is being said to them is that if you get this active drug, then you will lose your hair by an authority. Just as in the minoxidil study, they were being instructed by an authority, just as the Escalapian priest represented this towering authority. Now, <clears throat> let's pause for a sec and, and think about this. It's a very, very important concept. And it has a lot to do with what happens in the general medical setting when patients feel helpless and dependent. When I say authority, I'm not talking about the authority of a school teacher or a policeman or or something like that on a, on a social level. I'm talking about something far more primordial, something far more hardwired and instinctual. I'm talking about the authority of, uh, say, a parent over an absolutely helpless newborn. And if you think about it, and I've thought a lot about this, we all have this propensity within us. It's an absolutely necessary requirement for the survival of the species. When, when you were very young and dependent, just like me, just like the rest of the human herd, you had to seek out and find some healthful, loving, suckering authority who would take care of you, teach you, and protect you. And that pattern, which began way back then, like so many patterns, has a tendency to persist. It's primordial. It's hardwired. And what determines an authority, by and large, is the recognition of the one least uncertain in any given situation. And we see this a lot in, in the activity of the human herd. Uh, remember 9-11, where there was massive confusion, uh, 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 a tremendous state of national, if not worldwide, helplessness and dependency. Who is this? What's going on? And everyone turned to the one least uncertain for the answer. It's, it's no different in early childhood. And I must say it's no different whatsoever for most people when they receive a dire diagnosis, let's say, and realize they have to turn somewhere to someone in order to get help. And what I'm telling you is that that condition of helplessness and dependency triggers this already established, already hardwired pattern and helps the individual, directs the individual to, as it were, 
vast authority and the one least uncertain. In the case of the Asclepian temple, the priest is the one least uncertain. In the case of uh, the, your standard placebo control clinical trial, the white coat stethoscope around his neck uh, physician who's running that trial and giving informed consent, he's the one least uncertain. And frequently for us, when diagnoses are made, the patient looks to the clinician making that diagnosis as the one least uncertain. And unconsciously, this is not a conscious thing, vests authority in that person. And what we've learned, what I've, I've tried to illustrate with these anecdotes, is that when authority is vested in someone, their words can cut both ways. They can harm or they can heal. They can lose hair or they can grow hair. And it's not just hair. Think about it. For the last 70 plus years, modern medical science has been performing randomized clinical placebo controlled trials on virtually every malady that you can think of, diabetes, hypertension, cancer, autoimmune disease, the list goes on and on. And what do these studies consistently show? They show exactly what I've told you so far. Somewhere between say 20 and 30%, sometimes more, sometimes a little less. There are responders, placebo slash nocebo, I'll come back to that, responders, who respond with either positive in the placebo case or negative in the nocebo case responses, hair growth, hair loss. It's very, very important because when authority is vested in a clinician, could be an osteopath, could be an acupuncturist, could be a chiropractor, medical physician, nurse. When authority is vested, their words now contain the power to harm or heal. And that's something we need to know. Let me give you perhaps the clearest example from, from my clinical career. I was in the emergency department working a swing shift and went to the bedside of an elderly lady who had fallen and received a large horizontal gash on her forehead. And she had bled a lot. Before I got to the bedside, the nurse had set up what I needed for suturing, taken the vital signs and called the lab because enough blood was lost that we wanted to be certain that uh, she, she was not anemic as a result of that or at least we wanted to establish a baseline for that. As it happened that day, I, I was in the emergency room being followed by Dr. Ed Yeager, who was interested to see what uh, medical hypnosis uses were in the emergency department. I was doing a lot of hypnosis at the time. Now, I, I don't have time in this brief talk to tell you all that hypnosis can do, though I'll, I'll give you some hints and I'll tell you a few stories. But I'd like to ask you to understand that hypnosis isn't just trance. Sometimes it's waking suggestions, and especially it's waking suggestions when the physician has authority, as all emergency physicians do. Those people are among the most helpless and most dependent. You follow? So I approached the bedside. I implemented some elements of the hypnotic method. I, I sensed her basic, basic rhythms. I began breathing in her rhythm. I lowered my voice because I could see as I approached her that she was already in some form of restful state. And as I approached her, I noticed her eyes were closed and that she was peaceful and, and there was no indication of pain whatsoever. So I leaned gently toward her ear and I said, that's right, even deeper, just comfortable, only comfort. That's virtually all I said. Then I put on my gloves and sat down 
and I had to inject the wound edges with lidocaine to numb the entire thing up so I could clean it and uh, begin suturing it back together. That took a little time. And I probably injected the edges somewhere around 12 to 20 times, some shallow, some deep, just to be sure I had adequate anesthesia. I cleaned it all up, got everything ready, and started closing it in layers. And as I was about to begin closing the final layer of the skin, a wonderful and compassionate uh, lady from the lab, Dorothy, came to the other side of the bed, saw what I was doing, applied a tourniquet. She was the one to draw the blood. And then just before she put the, the needle into the vein, she said, a little bee sting. Now, at this very time, realize I was suturing away. I had given multiple, multiple injections. And yet, the instant that Dorothy put that needle in the vein, suddenly the patient's eyes opened. She screamed loudly and jackknifed up in the bed, much to everyone's amazement and in dismay. I leaned forward and said, even more comfortable. You can go right back to where you were and enjoy it. And she settled down and we finished the case. This lady had unconsciously, and it's always an unconscious vesting, she had unconsciously vested her uh, vested authority in anyone out there, anyone who was in the medical establishment. And so Dorothy's words had authority and Dorothy's prediction that something negative would happen was in fact a self-fulfilling prophecy. Words matter. The mind of the caregiver matters, provided they've been vested with authority. And so we arrive at lesson one in this talk. Lesson one, do not vest authority in your caregivers. Don't make that mistake. It's not necessary that you allow that to happen. And you have to consciously intervene. You have to consciously prohibit yourself and bridle back from doing so. Your care caregivers, you need to know while they're experts in a given field, are never experts in you. They don't know how their various ministrations will affect you or disappoint their expectations about what has happened amongst others. And so you have to be very, very careful. And the way to do that is to recognize right now, right during this talk, while we have COVID swirling around the globe, that you're in charge of you, retain your sovereignty and consider your healthcare givers, whoever they may be, consider them con useful consultants, consultants who so long as they remain useful, remain engaged with you. But the minute they don't realize they're not doing you a service, and you can find someone else. Most importantly in this, it, it serves you and, it, and it's, it's critically important to understand you cannot and should not accept ever a, a negative suggestion of any kind. If they don't have authority in the first place, that negative suggestion should fall flat. But if you hear a negative suggestion, that should be an even deeper reminder that this patient, that, I'm sorry, that this authority, so-called authority, this expert, is not worthy of my vesting authority, as I'm using that term, a defined term, the one least uncertain. He's not worthy of that authority, or he or she do not accept their negative suggestions. And here's why. Nobody in medical school, I'll, I'll pick medical school, but this could pertain to so many other kinds of trainings as well, sat in a lecture and listened clo closely to how to prognosticate. That's just 
the rarest if never thing. Any doctor that you sit with doesn't know his own tomorrow, can't predict his own tomorrow. It's impossible, right? All they can tell you is what their experience or their studies have taught them. And their experience, you have to realize, is very, very circumscribed. They don't see that many patients in a lifetime. Certainly not enough to understand the full range of outcomes for any given malady. They don't. And the studies that they're thinking of, those studies don't necessarily include someone like you. And, if, and, and let, me, let me distinguish that even more. They certainly don't, don't include someone like you who has listened to this talk and learned how to retain your own sovereignty, your own agency over self, and regard, and you can do this as lovingly as you wish, and regard their caregivers as useful consultants. Lesson one. Much for the time being, on the mind of the caregiver. Let's talk now about the mind of the patient, your mind, my mind. Not far from where I'm sitting right now, over at UCSD, some really bright sociologists decided they want to take a look at what happens as populations approach what they call positive life events. And in particular, they wanted to take a look at death rates as a positive life event approached. Now, initially, I believe they looked at the Chinese population. And what they found was fascinating. And they later confirmed this amongst other populations as well. Chinese New Year's, very important holiday. Families convene from all over the world and celebrate the Chinese New Year. What they noticed was in the weeks leading up to Chinese New Year, the death rate around the world falls precipitously amongst Chinese people. And then several weeks after Chinese New Year's, it begins to catch up and, quote, normalize again. This same phenomena happens amongst, say, Jewish people as uh, the Purim holiday happens. And as they approach this uh, holiday, the death rate from three major causes of death slows down, pauses, and then weeks after catches up again, and so on with other populations and specific holidays to them. Think about that for a minute. That's non-trivial as far as health and healing is concerned. These people somehow have pushed the pause button on death itself. These are people with cancer. These are people with heart disease, with diabetes, with everything that can cause death. And yet they've managed to pause it. Something in their system is sufficiently powerful wouldn't it be nice to know what that is, is sufficiently powerful to push the pause button on death itself, at least for a period of time. Remember, we're talking about the mind of the patient. Let's take another common uh, occurrence. Remember in childhood, I think most of us have had one or two or more incidents of this. Remember in childhood, when there was something out there at school or after school that we really did not want to confront. It could have been an oral report. It could have been a bully. It could have been some sporting event or some other thing, some essentially a potential humiliation that awaits. Now children have very little choice. And this is key to understand for all of us. Childhood is a time of limited choice. Adulthood, of course, we have much more choices, much wider array of choices than any child has. That seems so simple, but it's, it's so important to health and healing. It is worth noting. The child doesn't want to go to school, let's say. 
something terrible might happen, an embarrassment, a bad grade, confrontation. And so they wake up surprised the next morning, pleasantly surprised, to discover that they have a tummy ache or a fever or some other ailment that their parents can't say no to, that the child has to stay home with. Think about that for a second. The idea that I have to get out of this situation, I'm, I must find a way in amongst the limited choices that one has as a child, causes an illness. Well, almost everyone I've ever talked to over decades has said, oh yeah, I had one of those. That was, that was something I experienced. Yeah, I remember that. But do you remember this? When that event passed, that potential humiliation, whatever it was, most children don't stay sick. They don't go down the slippery slope, thank God. In fact, they get well. Now there's an important lesson in that, isn't there? Of course, the door can swing one way toward illness with that retreat into illness wish. I've got to get out of this, no matter what. But what's important, most important for us to understand is that the opposite wish, the wish to get well, also has power, also exerts itself through the body. And lo and behold, you get well. Once again, we're seeing that the idea this mental event, this phenomenon that's excluded entirely from physical science has the power to both harm and heal. And that's an extraordinary thing. Now, I was about eight or 10 years into my practice as an emergency physician at Scripps Encinitas Hospital when I realized there was one important, important question that I hadn't been taught to ask in medical school, that once the diagnosis was established, became in essence the most important question a physician or caregiver could ask. And that is, why today? Think about this for a second. A man comes in, say he's a 58 year old man with a heart attack. And I spend whatever time is required stabilizing him, relieving his pain, getting things squared away, making sure he's okay. And then there's a little downtime usually, a little downtime between the diagnosis and treatment and his being shipped off to the ICU. So if time permits, I go to this man and I say, you know, you could have had that heart attack a week or two ago, or you could have had that a week from now, two weeks, three, a year from now. It's curious, isn't it? I know you won't know the answer to this. Listen closely, by the way, to how I asked this question. I know you won't know, by which I'm signaling a, a, a cognitive knowledge, right? But if you had to guess, if you had to guess, and when I, when I say guess, what I'm really doing there is I'm conjuring, coaxing his unconscious to enter in and give me the answer. If you had to guess, why today? Why today? Now, I could give you hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of why today answers. Catalog those for you. And I do catalog a, a couple dozen in, in, in my book. But let me just give you uh, three or four today to give you a sense of how this works. The first person I tried that on was a uh, happily married 44-year-old gentleman with left testicular pain. I did the examination and I found that the structure above the testicle, which is called the epididymis, was tender and inflamed. And that all the other labs and everything else that was appropriate to that diagnosis 
were normal. So I referred him to a urologist, treated him for pain relief, gave him an antibiotic. The potential causes are myriad. And that wasn't going to be settled in the emergency department. And things were cooking in the ER. I had to get going quickly. But I had thought of this question. I, I actually was provoked to ask this question by a, a brilliant essay I had read in uh, John Topkins' journal. And um, I thought I'd try it out. Why today? And he looked over at me like I was some kind of a nut. And he said, well, I don't know. You're the doctor. Why today? I said, no, no. I don't know and you don't know. We're not going to know. But if you had to guess. And he was messing with his pants and his belt and getting everything, putting everything together. And I thought, oh, this is never going to work. Why am I wasting my time? I got patience. But just before I left, he turned to me and he said, yeah, I don't know, doc, but is this going to interfere, do you think, with the vasectomy I have scheduled tomorrow? My wife really wants me to get it. And I'm, not, I'm not so keen on it myself. Boom, there's your answer. An appendicitis patient, who I knew quite well, a friend of mine, got her all squared away. She's going off Candace wide a day. And she said, well, I have no idea. No, I know you have no idea, but if you had to guess. Long silence. Well, I don't know, but while they're in there, can they fix my tubes? Because my husband and I have decided to have children, but insurance will only pay if, I'm, if I come in through the emergency department. Why today? A gentleman with five mouth ulcers clustered all together, very painful, who never had mouth ulcers before ever in his life. Why today? I don't know. Yeah, but if you had to guess. I don't know. But let me ask you, Doc, is that going to interfere with my molar removal schedule for tomorrow? And on and on and on and on. The ideas, the, the wishes in particular, I've got to get out of this no matter what. I have to find a way to escape this, to retreat into illness, etc. Those ideas of the patient, not always, but often feature prominently as part a contributory cause, part of the etiology of their disease. In fact, when you break it down, these unhealthy wishes, in my experience at least, are common contributory factors. And they, they often come in the form of no matter what wishes, or retreat into illness wishes, or guilt. Now, guilt is a little more complicated, and we're not going to go deep into it. But this is an important thing for you all to know, too, I think. In many religious systems, guilt is not just the regret or shame one feels for having done something they think is wrong. <clears throat> it has another component, and that component is punishment, retribution. And so that's actually a wish for something bad to happen. And when that wish gets crystallized and formulated in the volitional system of a patient, it's often a powerful contributory cause in my experience to illness. Again, I don't have time to run the list, but I've seen numerous patients. Once I had five patients in a row come to the office, my medical hypnosis practice, with guilt engendered illnesses, cancer, arthritis, autoimmunity, the, the whole gamut, which if you think about it, and again, I say in certain systems, not all, is part of a, a, a deep-seated wish for punishment. Now, it's not only wishes, the ideas that can contribute to illness, that can be part of the why today answer. But it's also a thing I call dangerous identifications. Dangerous identifications are another kind of idea people can carry that can contribute to illness. 
And it's very, very important to be aware of that and to do one's very best at avoiding it. Let me give you an example. Uh, I recently saw a patient who, and unfortunately it took me a little longer than it should have to get this diagnosis. But I saw a patient who had uh, fallen into a real despair. He was a very despondent, depressed gentleman. And um, it was really unclear. He had had a, a series of mishaps, but they were uh, mishaps most people could have run with in one way or another uh, without falling into uh, a, a, an almost psychotic depression. But uh, unfortunately, he had. And I had to, after listening to everything, I had to go back and ask him, tell me about your father. Tell me what his life pattern was. Now, it's important for you to understand the details don't matter when we're talking about dangerous identifications. Identification, uh, for men, it's usually, but not always, with the father, and women, usually, but not always, with the mother. There are always exceptions and blends and uh, variations. But in this case, I learned that this man's father, when he was in his mid-60s, had had a financial misfortune, lost a great deal of money, uh, also had a motor vehicle accident uh, shortly after that, fallen into depression, and actually committed suicide. And um, it was especially important in this case because the patient I was seeing had been swindled by a, a business partner, lost a tremendous amount of money had a motorcycle accident following that, and now was seeing me for this horrible depression. And uh, that's what I call a dangerous identification. He was clearly sliding down his father's slope. Now, this is something common to all mammals. Um, monkey see, monkey do. We imitate. And we imitate, without going into much detail, we imitate a lot more than we think. Too much is attributed to genetics, uh, and too much is attributed to other causes and too little to our imitative propensity, in my opinion. But once it was known by me that he was on the sliding slope that his father had taken, it was relatively easy to point out that this is a slope that the, the front face of which was necessary. I mean, parents have to teach children how to survive how to relate to themselves, to a spouse or loved one, to the world. That's the job. But at some point, we're, we're, when our reasoning and our volitional capacity reach the point where they can free us from that, then we can begin to make adult choices. And so dangerous identifications generally happen without uh, the patient being aware that they're on this prescribed path, and that while that path may have served and frequently does in the early stages of life, it's not a prescription forever. None of us have to be what our parents prescribed, of course. And so these ideas, to, to encapsulate this, unhealthy wishes, including retreat into illness, no matter what, and guilt, and dangerous identifications, even if we had great parents, some lessons, some imitative lessons, maybe ones we wish, wish to forgo. These ideas of the patient also matter too, and lead us to lesson number two, very important one. Be careful what you wish. Be careful what you wish, and beware of dangerous identifications. Now, here we are in COVID times, and we're about, you, you are about to hear a host of different talks about what you can do to enliven life and sustain health and protect yourself. But I already know this about some of you who are listening. This COVID thing is tough. It's enforced isolation. It's changed our social patterns. It's made things very different, difficult. And a lot of people out there are beginning to say, to hell with it. I wish I could just get it over with. I wish I could just have it and be done with it. Be careful what you wish. 
be careful what you wish. There's another wish that's far better if you're starting to get tired of social isolation. I'll just give you some examples of how this plays into some of the most important things that you may be doing right now. You can wish for the positive outcome. You can see yourself a year or two or three from now playing with your children or your grandchildren or your friends, or even perhaps alone listening to some beautiful music or reading a, a, a wonderful book that you had always hoped you'd have time to read, but never got to. Healthy and well. Having in fact the antibodies of COVID, but having had a subclinical experience. This is very, very important. And let me tell you where it comes from, uh, at least in my knowledge base. Years ago, outside of London, there was an institute, a cold institute for the study of the common cold. This was written about by a wonderful doctor, uh, Atul Gawande, back in, I think it was 2002 in the New Yorker. And you can find that article, it's fascinating. What they would do is they'd invite people to this beautiful estate for a vacation free vacation. All you had to do is upon arriving there, receive an inoculation of a common cold virus, a rhinovirus. They put the cold virus right in your nose and then you were free to go. And they'd subject you to sometimes various conditions, sometimes not. But what I found most fascinating in reading about this that was that somewhere between, I don't remember the exact statistics, but between 20 and 40% of people, people perhaps just like you, experience what they call subclinical infections and, and what you hear today called asymptomatic infections, subclinical. In other words, you get the treat of the antibodies. And what a wonderful treat that is, protection but you don't experience any of the symptomatology at all. Isn't that a better wish for whatever might ail you? Think about that. So up to this point, we've talked about the mind of the caregiver and how what he or she says can harm or heal. And we've talked about the mind of the patient, the person and how the mind of the person can help or harm as well. I wanna give you one example from my experience that kind of puts this together in a way, but it also creates a new model, a new paradigm for health and healing, and will lead us to uh, our, our final lessons and how to mind your health. This is a story about a surgeon named Jean. Jean was a uh, surgeon on staff at Scripps Encinitas when I was. And he was a gruff and surly dude and uh, not a particular friend, I'd say. Uh, but his wife had called me and told me his story. And I agreed that I would see him a maximum of four times in the office. And so he thundered in uh, and exclaimed at the very outset, first words out of his mouth, this is bullshit. And then proceeded to tell me his story. Now the story was sad. Uh, if you think about it, here's a surgeon who relies entirely upon his hands, not only for his livelihood, but also for his sense of self. And what had happened to him was that the hands had become covered top and bottom with warts, not a, not a few warts here and a few warts there hundreds of oozing warts. And the staff was so concerned that they were thinking about revoking his surgical privileges. And in the meantime, he was double and triple gloving in order to perform surgeries. So this is a, a, a horrible circumstance. Now on the side, it might help you to know that every hypnotherapist in the world loves to treat warts because I don't know, it seems almost impossible not to be successful. And which is why I, I thought I'd take the case. Plus, I there, he was on staff and, and there was a sense of brotherhood there. But remember what I told you at the beginning of the talk. 
medical science today considers mind to have nothing to do with illness whatsoever. And it also considers mind to have nothing to do with healing, health and healing whatsoever. And let's think about that in light of Jean's case. I asked him, as I, as I think you would anticipate, this is horrible, I, I see it. But if you think about it, Jane, you could have had this five years ago, or you could have had it five, 10, 15 years from now. There's no reason that I can see why you have it today. And I'm sure you don't have a reason for that either. But if you had to guess, why now? Why today? And the answer is always the same. I don't know. You're the doc. In this case, you're the know-it-all. You tell me. Well, I don't know either. I'm not asking you to think. Just guess. Well, I guess it's so I can get out of this blank, blank job I'm in. I hate it and I'm ready to retire. And there you have it. Modern science tells us that human papilloma virus invades young skin cells, commandeers their cellular machinery, and turns that cell into a wart cell. And when I first started talking about this, decades ago, this, in this case, that was interesting, it was a wart causing a benign tumor, but now we know, of course there are hundreds of strains of HPV, but now we know that some strains are not just little benign things with funny, a funny word attached, but they can, all, they, they can actually cause cancer. So now we're talking about something really important here. Think about that for a second. Is it possible, is it possible that Gene's wish to get out of this thing, you know, his career, no matter what, was a contributory cause. I'm not saying the exclusive cause, of course there was a virus involved, but a contributory cause, say at the front end, for what at the back end were these horrible canvassing warts on his hands, and his hands only, not his forearms, not his elbows, not his shoulders. Well, certainly seems likely, doesn't it? And, it, and if, if mental causes are playing a role, then it would, and only then, would it make sense that something mental could relieve him of this terrible ailment, could cure him. I saw Gene for four sessions. And in those four sessions, there were a lot of little tricks and nuanced things I did as a medical hypnotherapist. And, and I gave him a, a mantra and told him to say it every time he thought of the words. And initially that would be quite frequently, intrusive almost, and as the words went away, disappeared, of course it would be less and less. And he thought it was all baloney anyway, but he went along with it because he was a, 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 a renowned cheapskate and I made him pay everything in advance. His warts went away. And the very fact that his warts went away without going into great detail, again, if you want to read about this fascinating case, it's, all, it's also in, in my book. But the key here is to understand that medical contributory cause, mental, I mean, contributory cause, and a mental cure. They went away, he found another way to retire, and he lived happily ever after, of course. We need a new paradigm for understanding health and healing, don't we? We all know, you know, you know when you walk into a medical establishment and you feel dehumanized, that something is missing, something vital, something important, something operative. And that is human psychology, human mentality, the emergent properties that make us more than the parts, than the cells and molecules. 
let me suggest that instead of thinking as a simp of a simple little material paradigm, material cause, material response, manifestation of illness, that we recognize for once and all that mentality, what I like to call noetic causes, psychological mental causes, contribute. Sometimes they constitute all the causes of an illness. Sometimes they constitute only some. And here's the way it actually works in my, in my strong belief and conviction. We have causes, mental and physical, and those causes press against what are called our host defenses. And those defenses are not just what you hear spoken about on television or what you read about in scientific journals. They're not just physical, they're mental as well. Your physical defenses are your immune system, your healing system, and so forth, things we know and study. But your psychological host defenses of equal importance are your coping mechanisms, how you deal with the noetic or psychological contributory causes. And when those host defenses get penetrated, they cause illness, disease. But that illness and dis or disease could be horrendous. Those warts didn't have to be just skin warts on the hand, for example. Those warts could have been a rampant viremia, an encephalitis, sepsis. They could have been warts all over the body, which has occurred. But they weren't, because on the other end of this continuum, we confront once again host defenses which limit those, in this case, warts, to, to, to simply hand warts and some social sense of dejection and depression. That was his syndrome, his signs and symptoms. Let me say it again so you have a sense of this. In the causal zone, we have causes mental and physical. They confront our host defenses. Very, very important. I'm going to explain why in a minute. And if those are weak or if they're bombarded, buffeted so much by a variety of causes, they give way and disease manifests. But it doesn't necessarily manifest in its fullest spectrum because once it's activated, it must again confront our host defenses, which filter it down, modify it, mollify it and results in the signs and symptoms that we as physicians see and diagnose. I hope you're with me on that because there's an important lesson in there for all of us, especially in these times of panic and pandemic. One of the lessons there is to strengthen your physical host defenses. Strengthen your physical host defenses. The next is strengthen your mental host defenses. And I want to talk about those two first. And then the final one is find a healer. It doesn't matter who that is, so long as that healer can partner with you into helping to address the noetic, the mental, psychological contributory causes that may play and illness, and see you thereby as a person, as a human. In other words, find a humanistic healer. Now let's back up for a second, talk for a minute about strengthening your host defenses. We've already talked about avoiding mental psychological co contributory causes of illness dangerous identifications, and baleful wishes. And I really want to emphasize that. So that was our first phase of symptom formation, but now we're talking about host defenses. Physical is very, very important, and I'd like to address that shortly, just for a short time here, with respect to coronavirus and COVID. This is one thing that I think most of you must uh, be aware of. Uh, has been profoundly neglected uh, 
in all the media, and especially by uh, our health pundits, and I think this is deeply regrettable. We know, for example, that vitamin D is exceedingly important, not just as a protection against coronavirus, but it's very important for the overall functioning of the multiple systems and myriad systems in the body. But we know in particular that patients with high vitamin D, levels above 20 or 30, let's say, are less apt to contract the virus. And if they do, that their uh, illness is much, much more apt to be mild. This is a, a, a fact demonstrated in multiple studies already. You can go out and lay in the sun, protect your face, let's say, um, lay in the sun for 10, 20 minutes on a, on a side each day, and next day have generated 20,000 units of vitamin D. And you live in San Diego, so why not do that? And if you have an answer for why not do that, then you can take five or 10,000 units of vitamin D. And what are we doing here? We're strengthening the physical aspect of our host defenses. But it's not just that. There are other things that are equal, if, if not more important, sleep. I don't know about you, but I know myself, the only time I get ill, knock wood, is when I miss sleep. So sleeping has to be a fundamental priority for maintenance of your physical host defenses. And likewise, exercise. And likewise, good nutrition. And unfortunately, as I say, these just are not stressed because people don't have an understanding of the role that host defenses play in the etiology, in the linkages, causal linkages that result in COVID-19, for example. But we do. And so understanding that, we have to prioritize, get your vitamin D. Be sure you sleep and sleep well. Exercise, that's vitally important. No matter what the lockdown, you've got to walk, you've got to move. The older people in my audience, I'm sure you know that you're around because you move. Keep moving and eat well, eat healthy. Now let's talk about our psychological host defenses. Psychological host defenses are tending to wear down. And it's not your fault. All you got to do is turn on the TV to see whose fault it is. Panic. No positive suggestions. I don't hear anyone out there giving positive suggestions. But I know most of you will make it, if not all. I think it could be certainly all of you will make it through this. But it matters. We've spent the last hour roughly talking about how ideas matter. You can't give up and surrender. One, one beautiful host defense that I learned from one of my uh, current patients is to look at what we're going through and understand what a delightful challenge this can be. Of course, there's going to be tragedy. And of course, we're gonna feel for anyone who's, who's hurt by this in any, in any way. I'm talking about personal challenge. You can do this. Picture yourself strong and having survived, perhaps having had an asymptomatic case, subclinical case like the common cold, which other coronaviruses, by the way, are. Preventing unhealthy wishes from penetrating those host defenses and being certain you have no dangerous associations, those too contribute. Coping mechanisms, finding the humor in it, finding a way to partner with people, whether it's on Zoom or telephone or however you prefer. Keeping social contact going. This is all part of host defenses. These are things you can do. When I worked in the emergency room, this is a little bit crude, but, but it shows you the value of humor inside of host defenses. I was working in a 
one doctor at a time, sometimes only three nurses at a time, emergency room, right on the freeway, right on 405, at a time even before we had trauma systems set up, so we would take all comers. And unfortunately, there were times when all comers were four ambulances arriving all at once. And what could one doctor do? And what could three nurses do? And so I learned internally that the best way for me to deal with that was to think, well, F me if I can't take a joke. Get in there and do the best you can. Make the best out of this you can. And I feel like I was blessed and fortunate because we seemed almost always, if not always, to squeak through those okay. And we certainly all did the best we could. But having a sense of humor, look at little me trying to get through this gargantuan thing. It's not so easy, and yet there is some humor in that. Finding the way, whatever it is within the context and makeup of your personality to endure a time like this is a wonderful addition. It's a wonderful reinforcement to your host defenses. Next, let me add that we all need to be scrupulous about who we let in as our healer, as our caregiver. It's important to tell them that you don't want to hear any negative suggestions. And if they can't do that, discharge them and find someone who can. You should be very positive and assertive about that, in my opinion. It's also important, if you can, to find someone who goes a step beyond that and who offers positive suggestions. Not just because they might have vested in them a bit of authority, which I hope I've talked you out of, but because those things can also be helpful as we've discussed, and they can point you, if nothing else, in the right direction. The right direction with COVID, for example, is getting through this thing, helping as many people as you can, if you can, and getting through it, perhaps only to discover that you somehow got the antibodies as well. Find a good healer and stick with them. Finally, let me take just a moment to talk about a curse that's so pervasive and common in the medical establishment these days that it really does call for uh, being addressed. And that is genetics. Some of you out there, not all, I hope, just some will have, as a response to all of what I've been saying, this. <clears throat> but my problem is genetic. But I have this gene. Let's talk about this for a, a moment. And my hope is that I know I'm not reaching all of you with it, but that I will reach some of you who need it most. And it's this. Even the best experts in the field of uh, human genetics now say more than ever that genetics is not destiny. And it never really has been. Ever since the beginning, we've known that genes have what's called variable penetrance that while some people may have the exact same gene as others, it penetrates differently. Some get the manifestation, some get a portion of the manifestation, others get just a piece of it, others nothing at all. And of course there are many, many different causes, physical causes for this variable penetration. And those causes are all subsumed under what's being called today epigenetics. It may have something to do in the cytoplasm of the cell or in something you're taking or some exposure or some other things. But what I wanna to add to that is that it's not just physical, physical, physical. In fact, I would offer that mind your mentality can be the most powerful epigenetic influence you have. And this takes us all the way back to baldness. That man, whether it's the first man in the Asclepian temple, or the guys who were losing their, and gals who were losing their hair in the early cancer experiments, or the control group in the minoxidil experiment, those were all originally influenced by a genetic disposition, a physical disposition to stop hair growth. 
And yet, what started the hair growth in the control group wasn't the snake oil. It was the very idea that putting on this unguent could cause hair to grow. And so what I would ask is that you think about your genetics as something that can also be controlled. Perhaps not perfectly, perhaps not entirely, but it's certainly subject to influence. And so how you think and how you formulate your wishes, because all of what I've told you, if you think about it, has to do with the human, except for, excuse me, except for identifications. But beyond identifications, it has to do with the human volitional system, an unambivalent, deeply held wish has the power, not just over your attitudes, but over your outcomes, over your very genes themselves. So let me see if I can sum up for you the important lessons of the day. The first lesson, and in many ways the most important, is retain your personal sovereignty in matters of health. Retain agency over yourself and your body and use your caregivers as useful consultants. Don't vest them with what I'm calling authority. The second is to unfasten or sever, if you will, dangerous identifications. For most of us, our parents did the best they could, but the path they took is not necessarily our path for maximum health and happiness. And recognizing that and insisting now on choice helps a lot of people along the way avoiding the pitfalls that were pre-programmed. Three, rid yourself, if, if you have any, of unhealthy wishes. You never want to wish no matter what. I want this no matter what. Because no matter what could go good or bad but also inspect for guilt. And if you can, get rid of it. And if you can't, find someone who can help you to get rid of it. And it may surprise you, there are a lot of people out there, friends, priests, rabbis, caregivers of all sorts who can help with that. But number three, be careful what you wish and rid yourself of unhelpful wishes. Number four, Insist deep inside yourself on positive outcomes, on health and comfort. COVID is a difficult thing that we're dealing with, but you can get through it. You can get through it healthy. You can get through it healthy, perhaps even with antibodies. And that's an important thing, not only for you to know, but for you to tell yourself in the deepest way you can. Five, and finally, understand that the sequence leading to illness, to, to disease expression, entails on the front end and back end, the strength of your host defenses. And so don't neglect them no matter what they say. Your host defenses don't only need a vaccine to happen someday in the future. You can do a lot right now to strengthen your physical host defenses with adequate rest and sleep, exercise, a healthy diet, vitamin D. You can do that now. And to strengthen your psychological host defenses with humor and determination and a resolution to only healthy solutions for the problems you face, only healthy solutions. And if you take all of these measures in total, then you defy the tiny truncated scheme material science presently offers us, which of course has to be wrong, has to be incomplete. And you become what I, what I hope and think we all should become, a whole person, retaining your sovereignty, insisting on your health, and getting through this thing with the rest of us 
in a healthy and comfortable way. Mind your health. That's my message to you this morning. I, I hope you enjoyed it.